Hi, North Star friends. I can't believe we're at the end of our book. Um, we're going to read the afterword today. The afterword gives you a little bit more information about the story. It's not too long. Um, there are also some, some pictures in the back of the book, and I'm going to try to um, find them for you and get and download them for you. Um, this is pages 107 through 113. Afterward, the U.S. Army lists 672 people dead or missing in San Francisco and the surrounding area. But the United States Geological Survey estimates the number should be three or even four times higher. So 2,000 to 2,400 people. Historian and San Francisco City archivist Gladys Hansen believes the death toll is above 3,400. Officially, only 12 Chinese died. But the Chinese handled their own deaths after the great earthquake and fire. They shipped the bodies back to China for burial, so the real number will never be known. The great earthquake and fire destro destroyed more than 28,000 houses, stores, and other buildings. Between 2,381 and 2,593 acres became a wasteland. The losses were about 400 million in damage in 1906. But dollars were worth more then. $14 could easily feed four people for a week. Groceries cost a lot more now. So do houses. The damage, if it happened today, would have cost over $7 billion in the year 2000. And it's 2020 now, so it would have even been a bit more. Most people think the fire was more destructive than the earthquake. That may not be true. Historian Gladys Hansen has done a great deal of research. She found a report from an army captain that stated some people purposely set fire to buildings wrecked by the earthquake. They did that because their insurance covered damage from fires, but not from earthquakes. Then they told the insurance companies that the fire had ruined them. This is against the law. It's called fraud. The investigators from the insurance company said that the great fire damaged the buildings. Even so, the insurance companies refused to pay their customers. This made it hard on the people who had told the truth and they sued. In the end, the insurance companies paid only a small amount to everyone. After the earthquake, the railroad companies were afraid they would lose money if people stayed away from California. So they also told everyone that the Great Fire had caused most of the damage. People can defend against fires. It is harder to protect against earthquakes. No one will know for sure how many buildings were actually wrecked by the earthquake or by the fires. Once the Great Fire swept over the ruins, it became impossible to tell. Despite the massive destruction, San Francisco carried on. The city buried its dead, cleared the debris, and rebuilt itself. At first, survivors lived in tent cities scattered around San Francisco. Later, the tents were replaced with shacks. Life was hard in these camps. Before the earthquake, about 400,000 people lived in San Francisco. After the earthquake, the population decreased to about 175,000. Recovery was even more difficult for the Chinese. Some fled the city. Those who tried to stay had a lot of trouble. Wherever they went, some white citizens would object, and the Chinese would then have to move to another spot. By May 6th, only 186 Chinese were living in a single camp in the Presidio. The others had left or had been moved to camps in Oakland. 
The city tried to keep the Chinese from returning to the site of their old homes. However, the Chinese asserted their property rights. White landlords also wanted their Chinese tenants back. In the end, Chinatown was rebuilt in its old location. For many years, San Francisco was filled with the sound of hammers and saws. It smelled of raw wood and new paint. In just nine years after the earthquake, the city held the Panama Pacific International Exhibition. It celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal. It also showed the world that San Francisco had recovered. People came from around the world to see it. Among them was Laura Ingalls Wilder, who was covering the event for her local newspaper. The Palace of Fine Arts, still standing today, hints at the scale and loveliness of the exhibition's building. As I mentioned in the preface, Chin, Henry, their families and friends are imaginary. However, the details about the earthquake and the fires are, burst on, are based on facts. Animals were nervous before the earthquake. Afterward, horses and cattle stampeded, and a panicked bull was shot in Portsmouth Square by a policeman. After the earthquake, people saved the oddest things, and that included a wedding cake. At least two Chinese junks took away passengers, and remember that's a small boat. In the refuge camp, refuge camp near Fort Mason, an Italian man held up a picture of St. Francis. People also stopped a runaway horse by flapping umbrellas at it. My description of the night before the earthquake is also based on facts. Enrico Caruso sang in an opera. There was also a roller skating carnival, and the best costume really did win $1,000. I have personal connections to the earthquake as well. Like Ah Sing, my grandfather was a houseboy. And of course, this is Lawrence Yap who is speaking to you, even though I'm reading it. He had gone home to visit his family in China. He returned to America on April 19, 1906. Oh my goodness. In those days, Chinese landed at the pier of the Pacific Mail steamship line. They were then kept in a building. Immigration officials would question them there. However, on Thursday, April 19th, the great fire threatened the entire waterfront. My grandfather probably landed on Angel Island instead, where he was detained or kept until April 26th. It would have been his first encounter with Angel Island. He would come to know it well. In later years, immigrants arrived there from China, and one of them was my father. So his grandfather must have come ahead of the family, just as um, Ah Sing did. Uh, and then his, his father came later, probably with his mother. I have also experienced many earthquakes in San Francisco. On March 22, 1957, an earthquake hit the city that registered 5.3 on the Richter scale. It was enough to shake our school. I wrote a science fiction story based on that memory, and it was the first story I ever sold. Then on, on October 17, 1989, another big earthquake hit. That measured 7.1 on the Richter scale and caused a lot of damage. My wife, Joanne Ryder, and I knew how bad it was from listening to our battery-powered radio. However, we couldn't see the wreckage because we had no electricity, so our television didn't work. The next day, Joanne had to fly to a conference. Somehow, we made it to the airport. A few airplanes were still leaving. When she got to the conference, she could see the destruction on television. Unfortunately, our phone had gone dead by then, so she couldn't reach me. I was fine, but she was very worried. 
In recent years, scientists have re-examined the 1906 earthquake. They have inspected the rocks in the fault lines again. They have gone over the written records. They are debating the strength of the 1906 earthquake. Some now think it measured between 7.7 .7 and 7.9 on the Richter scale. Every year, San Francisco honors the dead on April 18th. People gather to remember that day. A hydrant at the corner of 20th Street and Church provided water that saved part of San Francisco. On the anniversary, it is given a fresh coat of gold paint. Every year, San Francisco and other cities train for a big earthquake. Firefighters and police prepare for emergencies. Buildings are constructed better and stronger. We know that one day, another big earthquake will come. We do not know when or where. We only know that the earth dragon will wake again someday. And as I said, um, there are some actual pictures in the back of the book that I will try to upload for you. Um, and some of them look a lot like the different scenes that are described in the book. So we are coming to the end of the school year. And if you're still listening, the last week of school, we're going to do something really special and really fun that relates to this book and to the landforms, bodies of water, and climate and change padlets. So I hope you've been on them. And please, please, please feel free to make comments. I'm not sure I'll be reading to you again. Maybe over the summer. We'll see. Bye-bye.